Hi, welcome back everybody. In this module, we're going to be continuing our discussion of social psychology, but in it, we're going to be transitioning from some of the previous topics that we've covered to a very important and still to this day popular topic that's been examined by social psychologists. How not only our perceptions and understanding of the world can be changed through the social environment, but how our behaviors can be changed. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the topic of conformity, how being a part of a group and being in specific environments can shift our behavior. In the next, we're going to look at a very specific example of how conformity can be enhanced when we look at obedience, uh, in particular, obedience to authority figures. But I want to get too far ahead of ourselves with the obedience topic. I want to first turn our attention to today's topic on conformity. If we're looking for a textbook definition of conformity, it will actually find a lot of different ways that psychologists and social psychologists define what exactly conformity is. Some talk about it being related to changing our behaviors. Others talk about it as matching our behaviors to others. It, it's not necessary for us to have a perfect definition of conformity, but just so we can have something to agree upon, just understand that most people believe that conformity is all about finding a way to alter or maintain our behaviors in a way that matches others and is impact by others. When we talk about what we're trying to match or what we're conforming to, what we're looking at is another concept that's embedded within this idea of conformity called norms. Social standards that are either explicit or implicit within a group or just within an area that are being applied to the individual. Now, norms can exist in a lot of different forms. If you take a social psychology class, you'll learn about a variety of different types of norms that exist. But the general idea with conformity is that we're all pushed to conform to specific norms, to match our behaviors with others, or to do something that's kind of expected of us because we're in some particular group or we're just around people. But what pushes us to do those things? Well, this was one of the first questions that was asked by early psychologists, early social psychologists, trying to understand the ways that our behavior was being impacted by a situation. One of the first people to come up with a very ingenious uh, approach to trying to understand this concept of conformity was a gentleman named Musafir Sharif. In 1935, Sharif actually built off of a wild effect that had been discovered by cognitive psychologists called the autokinetic effect. It's this weird thing where if you take a person and put them in a room where there's no other sources of light but one that happens to be hanging from a wall and connected to something that kind of looks like a mechanical arm, you can get individuals through the power of suggestion and just time to have them see that light moving around within the room, even though it's not actually moving. It's a weird kind of optical illusion that happens because of suggestion and the way our eyes kind of misperceive motion when there's no other cues to go off of. Now, what made Sharif use this particular effect was a really weird kind of sub-note to that specific autokinetic effect. And that was the fact that he found, as we found time and time again since then, there were a lot of individual differences as to how much people saw this light moving. Mind you, again, the light wasn't actually moving, but he would stick some people in a room, ask them how much it moved, and they would see it flying, flitting all over the room, moving almost 15 to 20 centimeters, which is, is quite a substantial amount of distance. If you're thinking about in terms of inches, you're looking at almost a foot that these people were seeing this light move. Now, there were others that saw it move just a small, tiny amount, you know, half a centimeter or maybe an inch or so uh, is, is kind of the cap as to how far they saw that light moving. And there was a third group of individuals that he said would see it moving what he would call a moderate amount. It wasn't that it was just tiny steps that it was moving like one, the first group, or actually a, a great amount like the first group, or the, the little bit like the second group. But they were seeing it move in the, what he called consistent bandwidth, where it was you know, four to eight to ten centimeters that they were seeing it move. So what Sharif did for this study to explore conformity 
Does he first found the baselines for these individuals, trying to find that person that was seeing it move a ton, somebody who saw it moving very little, somebody who saw it moving a moderate amount, and then pair them together. So he would have all three individuals in the same room, and he'd say, instead of you all reporting these things on your own, I, without anybody else giving responses before you get to the next one, I want all of you to report how much you saw this moving in successive order. So you'd have somebody go first, another person go second, and a third person go third, with each participant actually hearing the other's responses. And this was the first time they could actually hear responses of others while they were exposed to this really weird phenomenon. And what Sharif found was that when people started off, they tended to sort of stick to their norms. Let's say the person in a triad, like you see pictured here, to report first was the person who saw it moving a moderate amount. Then the person who had seen it moving all over the place was asked to report what they saw, and the person who barely saw it moving at all every time was asked to report what they saw. Well, what he found in the very first trial was if the moderate amount person reported first, usually the other two individuals kind of converged on that person. In the next trial, they'd converge even more, and to the point where they got to the third and fourth trial, where they would actually overlap entirely. What was really weird was that this also continued after these individuals had left the group. And it suggested to Sharif that this was really a phenomenon related to conformity. The heart of it was the ambiguity in this event. Sharif later concluded that really what's going on here is that the people in these experiments didn't know what the right answer was, had no idea how to behave appropriately. So when somebody gave them an answer, gave them something to cling on to, they quickly scurried to kind of align themselves with that individual. And Sharif argued this happens all the time in social environments. We find ourselves in places where we don't know what to do, how to react, what to say, so we look to others. When they do something, we quickly fall in line, assuming that what they're doing is probably correct and it'll make our life significantly easier if we just behave the same way they are. There's lots of real world examples where this does seem to work. I'm guessing you might remember a concert that you've gone to in the past where you on the very first encounter looked all over the place to find out what people were doing so you could match your behaviors to what you saw them doing. You might have done this in your first class that you started out with this semester, looking to other students to figure out what to bring to the classroom, how to behave throughout the entirety of the semester. You might find yourself doing this at other events as well. Conformity does seem to sometimes happen because there is a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uncertainty as to what's the correct response in that given situation. But is it the only reason why we conform? For a long time, we assumed that it was. And then about a decade after Sharif ran this study, another researcher challenged this notion. This gentleman's name was Solomon Ash. And what he did to determine whether or not we conform in not just ambiguous situations, but what he called unambiguous ones, was he designed a very classic study that's often cited in most introductory classes and social psychology classes, and, and really classes that go beyond the scope of psychology, something that we call his line study experiments. And in these line studies, he used a very simple apparatus to show that sometimes we might conform in situations where there really is an obvious answer at play. He'd place a person in front of two sets of cards. One card would have what was he called a test line, and the second card would have these different lengths of lines. And he would ask people to report which line the test line was most like, line one, two, or three. And I'm guessing most of you sitting here on your couches or wherever you're at can easily identify which line that test line in front of you is most like. I'm guessing everybody notices that it's obviously much more like line two than line one or three. But could you ever be convinced that it's actually more similar to line three than line two? Or maybe even line one than line two? This is what Ash tried to get people to do. See these lines is not as obvious as they had originally thought. And the way they did this was by having his participants paired up with other people who actually gave a wrong answer. 
And to see how this works, I provided you with a link, a video link. And I would encourage you to watch this video. It highlights what Ash did in the experiment and some of the really crazy results he got. Just to sum them up, know that in his study, when he put people in this specific situation, he was able to get 76% of his participants to conform with the group on at least one of the trials that they were in. And he got about a third of the time people to go with the group when they gave an egregiously wrong answer. In essence, what Ash was able to show in this classic line study was that when we look at conformity, it's not just about ambiguity. Sometimes we can conform in situations where the answer is really obvious. But why became a major question that people started to ask after Ash published these results. Ash and others have went on to argue that the reason behind our conformity could probably happen in two different ways. Ash argued that many people in his study seemed to be conforming to the group because they just didn't want to stick out. They didn't want to be that person that gave an answer that was different from everybody else. He had a different name for it, but nowadays we tend to call this type of conformity public compliance. And a concept that's very closely linked to public compliance nowadays is this idea of something called the normative social influence. It's essentially an indicator of a weight that a group of people can have on us. This idea of normative social influence suggests that the more we like people, the closer we find ourselves to individuals, the more likely we are to engage in public compliance, even if we don't think those individuals are correct in their actions. In essence, if you want a real world example, think of the difference between you doing something because you're with your friends versus you doing something because you're with complete strangers. Those are pretty good. You're more likely to do things with friends than you are with strangers if you think that the group is not behaving appropriately. Ash, again, argued that many people in his experiments seemed to be behaving the way they did because of public compliance. We saw that one gentleman in the video, if you've watched it already on the Ash Lyon study, that definitely was going with the group, not because he agreed with them, but because he just didn't want to be the person getting stared at. There are, however, though, according to Ash, many people who sometimes conform to groups, even if they disagree with them, because they assume that there must be something they're missing. We nowadays call this type of conformity private acceptance. We bend to the group, assuming that eventually we'll figure out why we're doing things wrong, or we're not in agreement, in agreement with the group. Now, in Ash's work and other work on conformity, it's usually treated as a dichotomy. You're either bending to the group because you believe them and you need to figure out how to catch up to them, or you're bending to the group because even though you don't agree with them, you just want to stick in or you want to fit in. There has been some research subsequently, though, that has suggested that in the real world, when we're talking about conformity, these things don't have to be discrete. They might actually overlap, and in fact, what could start off as public compliance might eventually transition into private acceptance. A great example of this is when college students start their college careers and find out that there are certain days of the week where college students are expected to go out. And many freshmen struggle with this in their major research institute universities, where they are told they need to study nonstop and do large amounts of work, but then are told at the same time that something like a Wednesday night or a Thursday night are the nights that they are supposed to go out, that they're supposed to have fun. Oftentimes, because of peer pressure, they do feel compelled to go out, but they strongly disagree with this. But those same students, by the time they're in their sophomore, junior years, might be going out with the group, but now they might be under the impression that this is because they want to go out with the group. They need to go out with the group. It's the right thing to do. In essence, they've transitioned from conforming to the group because of public compliance to conforming to the group because of private acceptance. It's not that all of us do this in every situation, but there is the possibility that these things don't, again, have to happen on their own. A lot of our conformity might be a byproduct of both, even if, again, the group we're with is behaving in a way that really doesn't make sense. Now, we're going back to the work of Ashes. There are also other things that Ash and people have subsequently found to, to highlight why conformity might happen in these unambiguous situations. 
One of the things that Ash was able to show in his research was that there was an ally present, somebody not bending with the group, that dropped conformity levels dramatically. In fact, we went from about one in three times people bending to the group to just one in 10 times a person bending to the group if just one person within the experiment gave the correct answer. This was something that was actually depicted again in the video that you might have seen. And something closely related to this is something that Ash called the magic number three. The fact that when you created this unanimous majority, the unanimous majority had to be a certain size. But once you got beyond that, a lot of the effects were kind of minimal at best. He found that if somebody was paired up with another individual who was consistently giving the wrong answer, people almost never went with that single individual. When a person was paired up with two individuals giving incorrect responses, conformity levels really weren't that much higher. They tended to just report these individuals as not understanding things or, or just not giving the right answers. But when three people gave the wrong response, and then it was the true participant's turn, almost every single time in his experiments or all his iterations, he found the same amount of conformity in that situation as he would if he had eight people, 10 people, 20 people giving the wrong response before it was the true participant's turn. And that weird, odd, what he called magical effect is something that we've been able to replicate in other studies. In essence, you not only need a unanimous majority, but you gotta get at least three people before you're gonna get a maximum effect. But once you get past that, everything else is just kind of superfluous. There are some other things though that you can tweak to increase conformity regardless of these other situations. If you ask for quick responses, if you push that everybody needs to give the same response, or if you really find a way to, to kind of decrease the incentivization to getting people to conform, you'll get even more conformity. But if you allow people time to think, allow people to give discrete responses, or you incentivize people to give correct responses, like say paying people in the Ash Line study, conformity drops pretty dramatically. Now these effects have been found time and time again for about five decades. Another thing that we've started to look at over the last couple decades is how culture might again play a role in this specific social psychology topic. Some researchers have started to contrast collectivist versus individualist societies and shown that when looking at these different societies, a topic that becomes really critical when exploring who we're going to conform with starts to become even more critical in collectivist societies, and it's these things that we call in-groups and out-groups. In essence, you do conform a little bit more with your friends than you do with random strangers. But in collectivist societies, those individuals conform significantly more than we do with their friends and significantly less than we do when with strangers. It averages out pretty much perfectly, where we all conform at about the same amount. But who we're with matters a lot more in East Asian collectivist societies. And researchers, since discovering this, have tried to figure out what's behind it, what, what caused this to occur, and what the impacts of this are on individuals and the societies as a whole. There's still a lot to be explored, but hopefully from just discussing these things, you can get a sense of some of the different areas that we've gone since examining this particular phenomenon. One other area that people began to explore when looking at this idea of conformity is whether or not we can get people to not only conform in what they're doing, but in terms of what they're not doing. One of the things that's often explored when talking about conformity in this manner is this concept of something called the bystander effect. The fact that when we're in need of help, oftentimes it's much better to only have a few people that could potentially help us than to have a large number of individuals that had the potential to help. This idea of the bystander effect was first explored by, because of a very tragic case that occurred a number of decades ago, a case called the Kitty Genovese case. A young woman was unfortunately attacked and eventually murdered in the middle of the night in New York. Uh, to explain this case a little bit more and to understand how it evolved and some of the things that were discovered, I provided you with a link to a kind of summary of her situation and some of the concepts that you see listed here. I encourage you to watch it before you continue on. Once you've seen it, 
you'll see a good explanation of something again called the bystander effect, something that's been found time and time again in studies. Again, we're less likely to be helped when there's lots of people that could help us than when just a few could potentially help us. But what explains this bystander effect? The two researchers that are described in the video that you saw, Bib Latney and John Darley, spent actually many years trying to break down the source of this bystander effect. And two of the things that they examined are the concepts of what were called pluralistic ignorance and diffusion of responsibility. Pluralistic ignorance is kind of a universal effect that happens when people are with groups. In essence, when we find ourselves with others, we tend to rely much less on ourselves and our own thoughts and beliefs and much more on others to dictate what it is we're going to do. And the end result of this is that the group tends to make worse decisions when together than if they were a collection of individuals treating themselves uniquely or treating the behavior, I guess the situation, uniquely. This is something that was highlighted in the video when they discussed the smoke experiment that Latinay and Darley ran a number of decades ago. Another thing that seemed to be at the heart of the bystander effect is this concept of something called diffusion of responsibility. Not only do we tend to rely on our own responses less when we find ourselves in social situations and just go off of what others are doing, but we also tend to, while we're doing this, feel like that's more acceptable, feel like we're not responsible for our actions or inactivity when situations do arise and we're around others. This is what was really highlighted in the seizure experiment that was also talked about in the video that you watched. And what comes together when pluralistic ignorance and diffusion of responsibility meet, along with other situational factors that were discussed in the video, is this bystander effect. This really weird phenomenon where people really aren't very helpful when they're with large groups of people. And unfortunately, it's led to many sad, tragic cases like the Kitty Genovese case and others where just a single act could have really saved the day for a number of people. And it highlighted a really weird type of conformity. Sometimes when we're talking about conformity, it's not just about what we do with others, but what we don't do when we're in the presence of others. This research also was being kind of paired with other discoveries that were grim and understanding the power of the social situation on many of us in some very tragic cases. But I want you to do after we take a break here is watch one of the more telling and amazing videos that, that's ever been created in not only social psychology, but psychology as a whole. It's a video that was created by a researcher named Stanley Milgram. It's nowadays entitled Obedience. And it examines how not only we might not help people when they're in need of help because of the social situation, but how we might ourselves create really bad situations, environments for others, if everything is concocted correctly. In particular, if an authority figure starts to impact the way we perceive something and the way we start to behave in a given situation. In this video, <coughs> which is approximately 50 long, minutes long, you're going to see a number of people go through a, a very emotional journey trying to, to kind of overcome a situation that Milgram and others had concocted. I encourage you to really pay undivided attention to that video <coughs> and just be prepared for some pretty grim things that start to emerge as it progresses. Because Milgram's research was considered today a, a real stark reminder of how a situation can override lots of different things that we tend to describe ourselves as and can really impact a, a lot of our day-to-day -day behaviors in ways that we're completely unaware of. Once you're done with that, if you need to debrief a little bit, I do encourage you to reach out to me. But for now, in terms of this module, we're done with kind of the lecture portion of things. Just do not forget to watch that conformity video as well. That's it for today, though. Take care, and I'll see you all in the next module.